And hello, friends. We welcome you to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are really pleased to have New York Times bestselling author Daylene Berry with us here today to talk to us about her career as a novelist and a reporter and journalist and all the things that she has done in her career as a writer. And Daylene joins us today. She is a New York Times bestselling author. She's also a TED Talk speaker. And she was born in San Jose, California, but her parents moved her across country to rural West Virginia. And from there, they let her have all the cats that she wanted. So she was quite happy about that. When she isn't writing, she's reading. Since 1988, she's been an award-winning print journalist, a columnist, and editor who recently crossed over to write for online publications such as The Daily Beast, The Huffington Post, and the BBC. Sister of Silence, a memoir, is her first book. Since then, she's written or co-written eight other nonfiction books, including The Savage Murder of Skylar Niece, Pretty Little Killers, Cheating Ain't Easy, Tales of the Vintage Berry Wine Gang, Shatter the Silence, the sequel to uh, SOS, and also Appalachian Murders and Mysteries, an anthology. In 2015, West Virginia University placed Sisters of Silence and Guilt by Matrimony on its Appalachian literature list, and you can follow her blog at her website at dailyberry.com. and she's also very active on Facebook and Twitter, and loves to hear from readers and fans of writing and reading. So, Daylene, welcome to Chapters. I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, can't wait to talk to you today. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Elliot. So, I wanted to ask you first, just kind of in general, about, uh, about a lot of your writing, because you've done so much uh, as a reporter and a journalist and a and a writer, but a lot of your writing, uh, when we get into your memoirs, is very personal, and it comes from a lot of personal experience that you've had in your life, and and some of it is sad, and some of it, though, is inspirational, because you've been able to, to overcome that. Uh, can you talk about the, the process of writing about those experiences, and did, did you find that a cathartic experience for you to, to help you kind of look back and get over some of that? Can, can you explain kind of how that process worked for you? Absolutely. It was very cathartic, and I'll tell you, um, Sister of Silence was different than all my other books in that not only was it intensely personal, but it took me 20 years to get the story onto paper. I actually started the first year. I was a reporter in 1988 when I was at the Preston County Journal. I just had an old um, computer at the time, and I started typing out the story, printed it out on a dot matrix printer, which I still have the original draft of. And then as time progressed and I realized that I was in an abusive marriage and my children and I were victims of domestic violence, and I, and I realized that not from writing but from reporting on those issues in Preston County. And the more I covered that issue, the more it hit me that it was no different than the stories I was covering for the newspaper, um, the lives of people that had been just um, dramatically impacted by violence in their homes. and so. My, my story went from uh, one of a life about a woman married to a coal miner with several small children to the life of a woman who was trying to escape this violence and couldn't figure out how to do that. And so that's why it took 20 years because um, my children then were really young and I didn't want to do anything that would impact them negatively. And I just felt like I just needed to write it for me for the longest time. And then when they got older, um, they really wanted me to release it into the world and share it with other people because they felt like it would help other women, other victims. And so I struggled for a while to find a publisher, uh, to find an agent actually first. And one of the agents I worked with had a recommendation for how to, how to change the book. And at one point, that was about 2008, I think it was, it was alternating between my story and between facts about domestic violence, alternating chapters, and it didn't, I didn't like it that way. Um, the agent that eventually took over didn't really want it that way. She said, I think it's just better as your story. So it went back to what it had been, and then finally it was published in 2011, I think. So what kind of feedback did you get for, from readers or from other women who maybe had that similar experience when they, when they read your work and, and were able to kind of see your story, what kind of feedback or response did you get from, from other women who maybe went through that same experience that you did and, and identified that in some way with your book? Well, I, I just have to say that that's probably been the most rewarding part of all of this. Uh, writing it was one thing, but hearing from people who say, your story is identical to mine, and thank you so much for being willing to share your story because 
this is what I'm dealing with. And in some cases, they've been helped to get out of that situation. And I don't feel like I can take the credit for that. But I do think that it's a com it's a, an accumulation of different things in somebody's life, like maybe the encouragement from a friend or a mentor, um, a teacher, a neighbor, <clears throat> people that are just willing to speak up and say, you know what? You're not in a good situation. Maybe you should think about getting out. Um, so I think it was a, a cumulative effect in these women's lives. But that truly has been the most gratifying thing. Um, there was something I was going to say. What what I what I also take away is, <clears throat> and I think that this is important because we're probably going to have another recession here in the near future. It looks like, and one of the things that was pivotal in my life and my story was the fact that my first husband um, was a, an unemployed coal miner for a large part of our marriage. And when I started working with the people at Johns Hopkins who eventually used my book in their nursing classes, Jacqueline um, Campbell was the head of that program. It's a lethality chart that she uses. It's a scale used by experts who study domestic violence. And so second only to having a gun in a home is male unemployment when it comes to determining whether a woman can be killed from domestic violence. Mm. So my ex-husband was a male and he was unemployed. And so that dramatically increased the chances that somebody in our home, probably me, was going to be killed. Mm. Second only to having a gun in the home. Wow. And I couldn't believe that when she told me that. Mm. And this is something that experts that work with domestic violence know, but it's not something that the general public knows. Mm. So you have all these women writing and saying, yeah, my, my, you know, he was unemployed or he is unemployed, he's still beating me, whatever. It just really resonates with me, and I think that we can't get that message out enough that when people have male unemployment, they need to have outlets, they need to go to counseling, they need to go to you know, all kinds of help. People need to be supportive of them. Yeah, the idea that suffering in silence is not, is no, not, not the best way to do it. It's not, no, it's not at all. It just makes the problem worse. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know uh, you, you, that memoir was, was a great memoir. And another book that, that you wrote that <clears throat> really got a lot of national attention is a book called Pretty Little Killers, uh, which is a true crime novel. And not to give too much away, but you know, when I read this book a few years ago, I, I thought how disturbing and sad this whole story was. And not to give too much away, but basically uh, it, it involves a sweet, innocent teenager who was basically driven out in the middle of nowhere, stabbed repeatedly by two of her best friends for reasons that are kind of still unclear to the general public. How did you come about this story? And I know you, li you live in the Morgantown, Preston County area today, but how did you come across the story and, and what made it um, interesting to you or relevant to you enough to think, you know, there needs to be a book done about this? Well, at the time, because I was living near the rail trail, um, and I had seen flyers of Skylar missing on places like the Dairy Mart, um, all around town. I heard the initial story like everybody else did, that this girl was missing and thought, oh, teenage runaway, like everybody did. But then you, I saw the missing posters and something about that picture, just beautiful, beautiful girl, just looked so happy, resonated with me. And at the same time, one of my daughters um, was living at home with me. She, she'd she come back from California and she was living with me. And when she was younger, she actually ran away in Oakland, California. And she was gone for, a, thank goodness, only one day. But it was terrifying. I was at work at an engineering firm and I had to take time from my job. I basically spent the whole day making up flyers, sending them out to the police, and hoping that they would put them up around Oakland. And by that night, she was home. So it was just one terrifying day for me as a parent. And I couldn't imagine what the nieces were going through when I kept seeing these posters of her. And so one of the rumors in Morgantown was that she had been seen on the rail trail. So my daughter and I were walking on the rail trail, and we, like probably most people, were keeping an eye out for her. Never saw her, and it turned out that that was one of the false rumors. Um, but at the same time, I had people who had read Sister of Silence, and because they, they really reson my, re my writing resonated with them, they said, you need to write a book about this case. Well, at the time, it wasn't a really, um, it wasn't a really good time for me because I was busy doing other things. But the more people that contacted me, the more I felt like, you know, maybe I should look into it, at least give it the opportunity to see what's there. And then um, another author in town, teamed up with me and we decided to do it. Um, the nieces, it, you know, a large part of telling Skylar's story was whether the nieces were willing to work with us and that was a little bit tricky at first because 
their emotions were all over the place. They were still very raw. Um, they, they didn't, you know, have all the information about what had happened to their daughter. Um, and then the story came together because I sat down and did probably hundreds of hours of interviews with people that were pivotal to the case. And that was challenging because you had a gag order from the Board of Education. I just found out recently that the Board of Education, despite their claims otherwise, did put out a gag order. University high uh, school teachers couldn't talk. Um, if they did, they chanced losing their jobs, so that was difficult because that's where all three girls went. Mm -hmm. Students were terrified to talk in some cases because the public, the general public, was accusing anybody and everybody that had been associated with these these girls of killing or doing something with Skylar, not killing, because nobody knew at that time she was dead. Mm -hmm. um, so it was it was difficult, but. Um, I'm trying to think, was there anything else you asked me about that? <laughs> oh, no, I, I think you covered that well. I think you covered that well. You know, we learned that there is just, there's so much to this story, as you mentioned, and and I think the, the interviews that you did, and I know you, you co-wrote this with Jeff Fuller, um, really bring a lot of depth and context to this, but two things that really struck me about the book. One is we meet a girl named Sheila Eddy, um, who I think is really kind of a, a monster uh, in many ways. I mean, if, if you had to label her in some ways, and I want to ask you about her. And also the fact that um, the kids that did this to Skylar Niece, who, who was the girl that we've been talking about that was killed or, or missing at the time, went on social media and talked about this and, and openly shared this on social media. So can you tell us a little bit about Sheila Eddy and kind of who she was? Because I found her to just be an abhorrent person. And then social media and, and why did these girls do this and why did they engage in social media to kind of sort of keep the story moving and, and alive? Well, <clears throat> I think that that answer is twofold. Let me address the social media part first. Um, that was a time period. The murder happened in 2012 and it wasn't, the book didn't come out until 2014. So you had a two-year period um, and they were only put, sent away to prison a few months before the book came out. So you had basically almost a two-year period where social media had become this hot um, mode of communication, especially for teenagers. And so it was just an extremely popular, efficient, fast way to get your thoughts um, and your words out there. So I think that was part of it. But secondly, um, they seemed to engage in social media, especially Twitter, as a way to carry out their fighting, their infighting. And Ken Lanning, who had been with the FBI at Quantico for a long time, talked about how anytime you have a trio uh, of teenagers especially, one of those teenagers is going to be the odd man out. And unfortunately, that happened to be Skylar. Mm -hmm. And so you can see this trio disintegrating on Twitter. Um, Holly Malia wrote a fabulous article for um, Cosmopolitan, and it was called Trial by Twitter, just a really in-depth look at this entire case. And if you go back and you look at their tweets, it's just scary how much you can learn there that, you know, really probably helped the police in their investigation. The second thing, um, Sheila Eddy, I have to say that while I do agree with you about your characterization, having had a lot more insight into her childhood and how she got to be who she is now, really helped me to have some compassion for her because she lost her father twice. The first time was when he was in um, a serious car wreck that left him with a traumatic brain injury, changed his personality dramatically, and then the parents divorced. So Sheila was separated from her father, basically lost him as a little girl, and then um, you know lost him again later on. Uh, when her mother remarried. And, and her mother didn't remarry immediately. She had this relationship with her new husband. And um, so that separated her from her father the second time when they moved to Morgantown. And so her dad was way out in Blacksville. Um, and I feel like that loss was instrumental in causing her to become the person that killed Skylar. And those girls, Sheila, Eddie, and the other Rachel Schoff. Rachel Schoff that are responsible for killing Skylar. Right. Where are they now? You mentioned that they were sentenced to prison. How long? Where are they now? They're in Lakin Institution, a correctional facility, the only one in West Virginia for women, and it's um, over by the Ohio River. It's way out in the boonies. I drove there one time. Um, and Sheila got a life sentence uh, with eligibility for parole, I believe, in. I want to say 20 years, although that may be wrong. 
Um, and then it, Rachel got a 30-year sentence with eligibility for parole in 15 years. I doubt Sheila, because she never confessed, she wouldn't confess in the courtroom, I doubt she will ever see the light of day. That's just my personal opinion as a crime reporter. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're seeing this story, you're, you're doing these interviews, and, and you're, at, you're at, the, at the trial, at the sentencing, and you have that background as a court reporter, uh, but you're also thinking about doing this and writing this as, as a nonfiction story. What, how do you reconcile what you're hearing, what you're, you're hearing the family say, the friends say, the, the, the testimony at trial? I mean, how, how do you absorb that? Because it is such a sad and terrible thing that what happened to Skylar and and what her family is going through. So is, is it hard to separate the journalist in you from the writer in you and then absorbing all this emotionally and trying to, to tease, you know, tease out the differences there? Well, I prefer, my writing style is, and it's become more so over the years, narrative journalism. So I like to include storytelling details in my nonfiction, whether I'm writing for um, a journal or you know, a newspaper, online publication, or whether I'm writing books. And so when you talk about the courtroom scenes, that was probably one of my favorite parts to write about because you had, you had two groups of people. You had Skyler's family on one side of the courtroom with all their supporters, and you had the Clendenin and Eddie families, um, show families, on the other side, because when uh, Sheila's mom remarried, she became a Clendenin. And it was just a, a huge divide emotionally, physically, and so it lent itself well to, you know, writing about that in the book. But then you also had um, these two beautiful, intelligent teenage girls in the courtroom behaving in such polar opposite manners. Rachel Schoaf turned around, looked at the nieces, was crying reading this letter of apology that seemed very, very sincere. Sheila Eddy seemed like she was medicated, um, mm -hmm. seemed like she didn't quite understand what was going on, um, had very weird expressions at different times during the sentencing that indicated that she something was not quite right with her and that was very and so those things I mean the the psych armchair psych person in me really really liked writing not liked, but I appreciated that if I could write it well enough it would engage people and they would see what the same thing I saw in the courtroom mm -hmm. so that was important to me and, and I enjoyed writing about that so Pretty Little Killers also got some, some national attention as well. It was featured mm -hmm. on Dateline. It was featured on 2020. Um, and, and I think Dr. Phil even did a little bit yeah, of an episode on that. Yeah. So what was that like, and, and, and how involved were you, or were you consulted at any time uh, when those networks were putting those different packages together for those, those shows? Yes, yes. Jeff and I both appeared on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we appeared on the three shows that you named with the exception of Dr. Phil, and they flew me out because I'm, the journalist, I believe, and so I went on the Dr. Phil show, but didn't really say much. That was mostly, you know, about the nieces and the story, but um, the thing that I appreciated most about the news coverage from those networks was NBC did a phenomenal job. In fact, they sent in two senior, um, senior producers who worked on the story from the beginning far longer than any of the other networks did. They, and you could tell because the Dateline show, in my opinion, is hands in, I mean, it's, it's far above the others in terms of quality and the in-depth reporting that went into that. And so the producers met with us quite frequently um, on all the shows, but especially the Dateline show and got our input. And they, it was, it was a, I think that that's one of the reasons that that show turned out so well. Well, it's, it's a fascinating book about a, a, a real-life situation that happened right here in West Virginia, and I would encourage uh, anybody to read it and, uh, you know, read it first and then go watch The Dateline yes, 2020. Yes, absolutely. Because, because it gives you a lot more context, yes. and, and I did that. I, you know, I read this first a number, several years ago and then went and watched, and I felt like I got a much deeper yeah. understanding of what was going on. So we, we've talked about Pretty Little Killers. We've talked about Sister of Silence. You've got another book kind of in there, and that is Shatter the Silence, which was uh, <laughs> kind of the, the sequel to uh, Sister of silence so um so you've got this book shatter the silence that's in there uh and it's kind of a romantic and long-awaited sequel um and it's kind of set in the 1990s uh, in appalachia but this kind of focuses on the accounts of crimes that you covered 
while you worked as a news reporter yes. and, and that career as a news reporter. But we've got details in this book of your divorce, uh, of kind of your ex-husband's ongoing harassment mm-hmm. after the divorce. Um, and then we have a little bit of an interesting connection because there is a romance that you have with a police detective who sort of first becomes a colleague yes. and then a friend. But ultimately, we learn he helped save your life. Yes, so absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about who he was and, and that relationship yeah, sure. and how he helped you? Well, I'll tell you, um, Joe Stiles um, and Charlie Haney, I ha- can't talk about Joe without talking about Charlie. Um, I first met them at the Preston County Journal within the first week I worked there because Linda Benson, my then editor and fabulous mentor, just an incredible woman, she sent me across the street to start collecting the sheriff's department news and um i had a car there was a car accident and i was to cover it and she basically said this is what you do and so i went over to do it and uh the first thing that happened was um pretty much where the book opens and that was uh i got flack from charlie haney who was the investigating officer and joe was his foil because while charlie was being difficult not wanting to give me the information that i was was legally able to have as a journalist Joe was, you know, coming up, shaking my hand, saying, you know, he's having a bad day, look, him, look over him. And it turned out that I really thought at first that Charlie was just going to be a pain and I would probably never like him. <laughs> and then it turned out he's now the city police chief in Kingwood, a phenomenal guy. So it turned out that um, for two years, um, the three of us worked together because they were two of my best sources at the sheriff's office. They, after they got to know me, they gave me just anything that they had that they could that I needed for crime stories. And so I got a lot of really fantastic stories. And um, I was still married. And then um, when my ex-husband and I divorced, um, Joe asked me out. And um, we went out and we started dating. And um Basically, it was just this wonderful, dramatic change where I learned what love is supposed to be like from him. And he saved my life, I think, in that way, because if he hadn't taught me that, shown me that, uh, I hadn't experienced that, I would not know that now. And I would probably be far back, you know, my development growth wouldn't be where it's at now. But then in addition to that, because of all the abuse and the trauma in that first marriage, I needed to get out some of those feelings that I'd locked away. And I found myself getting sucked into this depression that left me almost unable to function. And Joe worked with my therapist, got me a charity bed at Chestnut Ridge Hospital, and I admitted myself and was there for two and a half weeks and was diagnosed with major depression, PTSD. And um, in two and a half weeks, I walked out of there a different person. And had it not been for Joe's help and um, my therapist, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be here now. So what kind of relationship do you and Joe have today? Um, Joe's now with the AG's office, so he's kind of gone up in ranks. And so um, he's very busy and um, don't really see each other that much. Um, but, you know, if I have something that I need uh, of a work nature, you know, I can reach out to him that way. Very yeah. Good. So what is Daylene Berry working on next? Daylene Berry is working mm-hmm. on a book that is about human trafficking. And I started this in August because um, I have a daughter who's been missing for a while. And while the police officially took her off the national missing persons list because um, they they found information that indicated she's not missing she's just not communicating with anyone and that's all we know but because of that and because of going through the story with the nieces about Skyler um, in both of those cases uh, police looked at you know the possibility of human trafficking being involved in their daughter's case and my daughter's case and so I've been fascinated by that and I've, I know people that have been involved in human trafficking and I thought what if you had a mother who whose daughter was gone and didn't she didn't know where she was but it turned out she was a victim of human trafficking what would that look like and how would that mother deal with that knowledge and what would it look you know what how would it end and so that's the story I'm writing now. 
Very good. Excellent. So it's all fiction. It's it's absolutely. all fiction. It's absolutely. Good. All fiction. Yes. Okay. Very yes. good. Excellent. My first foray into fiction. Oh, very good. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. It sounds like a great book. Sounds like it's going to be a great book when you get it finished. Thank you. So in our final moments with you today, Daylene, if uh, someone wants to get in contact with you, uh, we kind of mentioned this a few minutes ago in the open about, uh, you know, you do have a presence on social media, but if folks want to get in contact with you, how can they get in contact with you if they want to talk to you about Pretty Little Killers or Sisters of Silence or Shatter the Silence or your career? How can they do that? And then where can they get copies of your books? Well, they can contact me via email. I'm, I'm open to Facebook messages, but I'm not real. It's not a really good place for me to respond to something like that. So email daylene.berry at gmail.com is the best way. Um, they can even find my phone number online if they have to call me. Um, and as far as the books, uh, I always tell people that if you go to a bookstore and they don't carry my books, have them order one for you because if you don't like it, they can send it back and it's usually no charge to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Amazon is always a good way. And libraries are the same way. If you go into a library and there's a book that you want that they don't have, they will order it for you. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. So Daylene Berry has been our guest here today on Chapters. We've been talking to her about her career as a journalist and a reporter. We've also been talking to her about her books, Pretty Little Killers, Sister of Silence, and Shatter the Silence. Really, really great stories. Uh, very personal in nature, uh, but also uh, inspirational in many ways. And Pretty Little Killers, uh, a great story about a very sad event that uh, in many ways uh, with Skylar Neese and her murder uh, that still is resonating and permeating uh, even today. So Daylene, thanks for coming on Chapters. Congratulations. Congratulations on all your success, and as you get that book done on human trafficking, we'd love to have you come back on to talk about it. So I'd thanks love a lot. To. Thank you, Elliot. We also want to take a moment to say thanks to the staff and management of Empire Books and News and the Inner Geek for providing our on-site support and assistance today. We encourage you to come down to Empire Books and News and the Inner Geek and inquire about Daylene Berry's books, and also remind you that many of the author, editor, and publishers featured on our program have their works for sale right here at Empire Books and News and the Inner Geek. So come on down to Pullman Square and get that reading taste or need satisfied right here at the bookstore and we appreciate all their support each and every episode and if you'd like to stay in contact with the program and reach out to us with questions comments or feedback about this program or any program that you've seen on our chapters program we've made that possible through you via three ways the first of those is our email address which is right here at the bottom of the screen we do ask that you please include your name and the city or town in which you're writing from so that we can keep track of that correspondence we also have a chapters presence on face on twitter and on facebook and the uh, Facebook feed is also right here at the bottom of the screen. There we have our more recent author, editor, and publisher interviews archived for you there as well. You can interact with the viewers of the program, share shows onto your page, and do all of the other Facebook interactions there on our Facebook page, and that address is right here at the screen at the bottom of the screen and you can also check us out on YouTube. We have a chapters page on the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube. That address is right here at the bottom of the screen. All you need to do is look for the chapters tab once you push that address or punch that address into your web browser and from there we have all of our author, editor, and publisher interviews archived for you there as well. So if you like Facebook, if you like YouTube, if you like email, we've made it possible for you to stay in contact with the program through a variety of those different platforms and we know many of you have done that, many of you have commented on the programs and shared those programs via your social media feeds and your email feeds and we appreciate that very much so please keep all those comments and feedback coming and that's going to do it for us this time on chapters but please come again next time and in the meantime stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community